everyone. everyone. Wait, you fixed the lights or you made them crazier than ever? <laughs> okay, uh, you know what? Here's the thing. I'm, no, no, no. Let uh, me fix this. Okay. All right, Let's let me try it. to. We literally look radioactive. We do. The hell? Maybe just turn it all off. All right. I don't know. You Jeff, would think. Way, Jeffrey Smart's makeup, I can see now. The makeup is stunning. The lighting is stunning. Your oddly looks amazing. Why do we look like crazy people more the host? Hi, guys. <laughs> I can't. I'll just, I'll give everyone a glimpse. Look at the stunningness. Stunning. <laughs> stunning. And then and... stunning. Yes. You know what? It's all I not Goodbye. It. I'm furious. We're the host. And, and by the way, welcome to Stars in the House. This is our 100th episode. Oh, yes. Isn't that exciting? Our 100th episode, and yet we still can't get the lighting right. Cannot figure it out. Well, but this is where the but, And also, by the way, the camera looks like there's a weird delay. So everything is horrific. But welcome to the show. <laughs> what it starts in the house. We do it every single day, 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. The only thing that's good is that it's blurring out all my features that have never looked younger. It's all that we see are eyes and a tooth. A tooth? We do it every single day, 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern. We're doing it basically to bring people together because, like, the whole world is isolated right now. So we want people to feel good and come together and make comments and feel like we're all connected because we are. But also, we'd love to raise money for the Actors Fund. And the Actors Fund, however, is a misnomer oh, that yes, it is. people in the business still do not understand. The Actors Fund is not just for actors. It's for anybody in the arts. What is it, James? <laughs> the Actors Fund is, you make fun of me, a human services organization that is for people of all kinds in the in the performing arts, meaning stage managers, casting directors, gaffs, lighting designers, artistic directors, okay, people and their staff. What? I think it's gaffers, not gaffs. I think a yeah. gaff is like a blooper. Bloopers, gaffs. Anyway, I think well, it's going, gaffers. We're not so from the TV go. world. We're we not no, exactly. I'm trying to throw them. Throw I know. So throw name dropping. Like, it yeah. backfires. Um, but really, people all over the country who are in the performing arts who are out of a job, and which is basically almost everyone in the performing arts right now. Yeah, so the Actors Fund is is getting so many, they usually get, they said like 200 requests per week. They're now getting 200 at least per day. Right. And of course it's now increasing because I don't know if you heard, but Broadway's not been delayed till September. But by the way, it's not just Broadway, it's all live performing. It's like, it's, it's right. kind of, it's over right now. And it's not just the performers, it's the ushers, the box office people, That's no right. one is working. So everyone is turning to the Actors Fund to pay their rent, pay their medical insurance. So anything you can donate would be a broad bot. And by the way, people are listening from all over, by the way, look at this. Good morning from, Germany. And by the way, good morning. Good morning. Oh, I guess it's it like, is good morning. Yeah, it's like 2 a.m. Wow. there. That's so crazy. that's early. So you have a letter from the Actors Fund? Well, I mean, yes, there are two. I wanted to just read two thank you letters that are to the Actors Fund. Um, here's number one. I'm writing to tell you how extraordinarily grateful and touched I am by the grant that I received from you. To be honest, I'm floored by the immense generosity. I feel blessed to have your support, and I can not tell you how much I appreciate all the hard work that is going into getting these grants to the other artists like me. And here's another one. This is just a note to say thank you for the generosity of the Actors Fund to my family during this difficult time. Your organization is helping me pay my mortgage and feed my family. I am so grateful and do hope to pay this forward in better times. Your kindness will not be forgotten. That's just been so wonderful, by the way. We've had some really successful actors come on the show and say, by the way, I was totally down and out. Ten years ago, I went to the Actors Fund and they bought me shoes. I mean, like, People, it really does keep people alive and in the business forever. So anyway, so every donation you can give really helps. The minimum donation uh, is five dollars. I turns out you can't go below that. I don't know why, but you can't. <laughs> hey, Julie, maybe give Manny some more food because she's chomping down. Um, <laughs> if you go to starsinthehouse.com to donate, you see it's scrolling there. Donate to Stars in the House. But then I'd love you to forward it to Stars in the House 2020 at Gmail, and then perhaps Yardley would read some names to people who donated as Lisa Simpson. I'm just saying, she's making a face, saying yes. <laughs> so you donate to Stars in the House.com, then you forward it to Stars in the House 2020 at Gmail, and we'll get a list of who's donated what. Um, and, and our amount, Seth, we're literally- we're so close. $300 away from reaching $300,000 raised on Stars Isn't that in the House. exciting? $299,700 has been raised in Stars in the House. Jennifer's dancing, <laughs> still got it, she's looking good, she's a sassafras. <laughs> okay, uh, um, anyway, so yeah, starsinthehouse.com, and, yeah. and then you forward, by the way, I love that we have this Simpsons poster. Well, I had us. to, I had to bring it, there's a whole story there, and and yes. um, so 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 here's the thing, We're this is our first time to kind of do this sort of segmented show, which I love. We're always trying to something new, right? So we yeah. thought on episode number 100, it would be the first half is gonna be Yardley with the segment with Dr. LaPook, followed by Jennifer Smarts. We're like splitting them up in two to have longer segments. Hashtag so comedy ladies. Breathe. Yes, there you go. Um, so we're a family obsessed with The Simpsons. Yes, yeah, so help, come on, Julie. So Julie come, those, Julie's obsessed. Julie's much, Yardley, you met Julie when she was like 11. She's much older now. Yeah, I was 11 when we first met. 
You gotta share, honey. I'm gonna. I'll just. I'll send her in the back. I'll and um, sh- actually, she's not even on screen yet. What? Cut. Are we telling just, the story about the poster? No. The poster. <laughs> oh, okay. The girl comes on. I'm just saying. She's shocked when she sees you. All right. So uh, please welcome the lady. She plays Lisa Simpson. Uh, yeah, I'll show a clip when she comes on. There you go. She's such a brilliant actress. The amazing Yardley Smith. Hi, Yardley. Hi. Hi. Oh my God, I love your house. Oh, that's so cool. Look at all the cells. Uh, oh my gosh. Okay, yeah, we've got, I'm going to go wider. Uh, okay, so first of all, so you came on my radio show when Julie was just a little girl. I introduced Julie to The Simpsons. I'm obsessed with the show. Julie became obsessed. And then how did we get that poster? I don't even remember. Uh, Yardley. Yardley oh, sent me a How to Draw the Simpsons book. That's a book. book. Yeah, and I actually and am an well, expert at drawing The Simpsons now. But you actually wrote, if I could name every single one of these characters, Seth would buy me a car. And, and I never agreed to that. It's not going <laughs> so well. Yeah, she's not so good at names. However, the book has helped so much. She showed me this. Is the video here? Oh, yeah. So this is the video because Julie's a great artist. But the book, I didn't even know they got that for you. Yeah, here, you watch this got video. That for me. This is her latest. <laughs> viral so Yardley Smith, Lisa Simpson, can be on my dad's show. Thanks. <laughs> that is incredible. Can I have that? Yes! Oh. oh my god, 100%! I will send it to you ASAP! Yes, isn't it? Oh my god! We're, that we're, is, um, I watched the um, I watched the little video of you doing incredible ma- makeup to emulate Billy Porter's makeup. Oh my god! <laughs> you just are like, you just do everything, don't you? You just rock it out. All over the place. She's basically a drag queen. Um, <laughs> so, Yardley, so many things to say. I can't tell you like what fans we are, super fans. Um, okay, so you got it's the most basic, but how did you get the actual yeah. Simpsons job? Because I know that you are you are an act, you are a camera actress. So were you also doing voiceovers? Also, what's the deal? No, no, uh, and, and um, you know, I wanted to be an actor since I was like seven, five like for as long as I can remember. And I had a very, very specific plan of what world domination would look like. And voiceover was not part of it. So um, when I, and so what's great is though, and to all of the aspiring actors out there, and because we're on um, Stars in the House and you guys are all part of the Broadway family, I actually got The Simpsons because I was doing a play in a tiny theater. It would be considered the same as like off, off or off, off, off Broadway if it was in New York, um, here in Los Angeles. And I would say like 17 people saw that play and a year later, one of those 17 people said, and who was casting The Simpsons on the Tracy Ullman show said, I know who should play Lisa Simpson. Wow. Just wow. based on your, the was it based on the role you played in the play or just- the Yes, play? so, and what's funny is that part, so it was a play, I think there were four of us in the play and, uh, or five, the small cast, uh, I played a teenage girl who wanted to join the army and sang Elvis Presley songs. So I mean, a lot like Lisa Simpson, at all not, at all. <laughs> and level. so I really, her name was Bonnie Pietala. She was our casting director for 25 oh, yeah. years. And uh, I just, she's, and what I love about Bonnie is that she still to this day sees everything. Like she makes use of this town in a way I've never known anybody to. And uh, thank goodness she came to that show. Is it her yeah. name? In the, is it in her name in the credits? Is Bonita? Is that her full yes, name? Yes, Bonita Pietala. Yeah, Great. and you know the thing about theater in LA is that it does not have the cachet that it has in New York. So. So oftentimes, and I was doing what was known as equity waiver, which is a great little thing, 
uh, <laughs> where you have a theater that has 99 seats or less. This had considerably less. <laughs> and um, equity basically gave its blessing saying, OK, if there's going to be theater in L.A., we're going to have to make some exceptions. And so you have your big companies like the Taper and you have, you know, the Pantages, which books in the bus and truck. But um, then you have these little pocket theaters, little black boxes. And yeah. Most actors do those shows to get other work. So it really, the whole thing is, has a completely different flavor to it. I was doing it because I started in theater and I love theater. Now, why have you not done a Broadway show? Are you interested in doing one? I did uh, The Real Thing. I took over for Cynthia Nixon um, with Jeremy Irons and Glenn Close. And when did Yeah. Yeah, when Cynthia got pulled out of the real thing three months in to go do Hurley Burley, I took over her part because I had been her understudy. Oh, my God. So what was it like doing a Broadway show? Oh, my God. It's a dream come true. And I had only been in New York. When I got the role of understudying Cynthia, I'd only been in New York for six weeks. Whoa. So, I, you know, and I was 20 years old and I was like, oh, yes, well, this is fantastic. I mean, things are going exactly as planned until my agent said, oh, Yardley is for the understudy. I was like, I'm sorry, what? Oh, no, 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 no. Not part of the plan for world domination. And she said, you are going to sit down and shut up and pay attention. And so I did. <laughs> that, um, that was a while ago, though. Would you like to come back to Broadway now? Oh, in a heartbeat. Yes. Absolutely, in a heartbeat, I would do it in a hot second. And um, and the great thing about The Simpsons is that, uh, you know, it's it's really been the best job in the whole world. Um, it's made me um, financially independent, but it also, so it's given me a lot of opportunities to make the most of an opportunity that I took advantage of, what, uh, 1987, I think? That's a very long time. It's a really long time ago. So uh, yes, I would do it uh, in a hot second. Well, by the way, it's so funny you mentioned Jeremy Irons because I'm trying to like, collect my favorite clips. And my friend Paul Castry, who works in the show, we're both obsessed with this clip. So this is this is when you actually meet a girl smarter than you. You remember the episode? Ah. It is so, you're actually- oh, that, oh my God, that is maybe, that is probably the, that's the first time I remember that they, gave Lisa Simpson a friend who was smarter than her. And I'm like, what else are you going to take from my girl? <laughs> <laughs> That's devastating, but such brilliant line reading. Here, here's the clip. I'm upset. Oh, really? I... Oh, don't be modest. I'm glad we have someone who can join us in our anagram games. We take proper names and rearrange the letters to form a description of that person. Like, uh, no, I don't know, uh, Alec Guinness. Genuine class. Oh, <laughs> very good. All right, Lisa, um, Jeremy Irons. Jeremy's iron. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's so devastating. devastating. Yeah. It kills me. It just kills me. It kills me. <laughs> there are no more letters left. Like the S was moved. <laughs> There's nothing left. I and by the way, if I was tasked with doing the same, I'd end up with the exact same answer if that. So I was like, my heart goes out to you, little Lisa Simpson. It's so <laughs> difficult. Hey, Yardley, so what is a typical, like, you know, we've, yeah. we've had, like, Caroline in the City was here last night. And so there they have a table read at the beginning of the week, and then they end the week with an audience. Do you guys have a table read? Yes. Yeah, so we do, um, when we were, now we're having the table reads on like virtually like this on Zoom. And we're actually also recording from home, which is wow. sort of hilarious. Uh, they sent us all little uh, kits with an external recorder and a microphone, but I have a, I co host a true crime podcast. So I actually already had quite good equipment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's I love true crime. Though. It's called uh, Small Town Dicks. Here's my, here's my Small Town Dicks mug. Thank you. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, we have uh, 17 million downloads. Uh, we're almost three years old. We're doing really well. So I'm excited about that. Um, so, but before, even before the, you know, the COVID nightmare, we would have a table read with everybody, all the actors and all the writers. And also, should you ever come to Los Angeles, our showrunner likes to have about 
they like to invite guests to sit in the conference room so that you get a really live reaction to what jokes work and what don't. And so um, <clears throat> we do that, we read the script through once, and that's the first and only time that the, all the writers hear it all together with all of the actors, and they see what works and what doesn't. Based on that reaction from the, pe the guys at the table who, you know, may or may not sort of beef up their laughter. Um, but, you know, if the room doesn't think it's funny, the room isn't going to give you, is not going to give you an easy lob. So um, they go back and rewrite that script. And then that would be on a Thursday. And then 10 days later, we record that episode. And it's then it takes eight months to animate one episode. It's forever. So wait, so I'm back to the live audience. I'm so interested because because sitcom, sitcoms have live audiences, so that's so smart. So you actually bring in a mock live audience. I mean, it's all guests. They're all invited guests and things like that. But it really is, it really obviously, I mean, like anything, like one of my favorite things about theater is that exchange with the audience and that energy, you know? Uh, and the other thing I love about theater is that you get on the train and you can't get off until it pulls into the final station. So if, yeah. you know, you get in trouble, somebody goes up, you better... I don't know if you can swear on this show, but you better figure it out is all mm -hmm. I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. So hold on. So then it takes eight months. So, and yet the Simpsons episodes always seem so, so timely. timely. Yeah. What's up so, with that? Yeah. So yeah. There's about uh, three periods over the course of that eight months when we can do pretty major ADR, which is, you know, pick up. So we'll do a rewrite. They'll come, they'll see, uh, first they'll see pencil drawings and go, okay, that work, that joke works, that joke doesn't work. It, you know, change this, change that. And up until I've done ADR up until about 10 days before it airs. Yeah. That's fine. So you have sort of work to make the new words match what they call the mouth flap. Yeah. Um, but uh, but they also have this uncanny ability to be extraordinarily topical, and there's the whole prediction thing, which, you know. She's obsessed with that. I am completely mind boggled <laughs> by how many things are so accurate in The Simpsons before time even happened. Yeah. I it's know, I know, it's true. Jesus. <laughs> Has there ever been like a corona type of episode? I'm trying to remember if there's ever been yes, a Yes, actually, I, I want to say somebody brought it. I did, I moderated a Simpsons panel um, last, this past weekend, and they, we, we went to Japan and a pandemic broke out and we don't call it the coronavirus, but it was, it's so close as people are just like, ah! yeah. Wow. Bizarre. <laughs> Again, so I watched that episode and that episode there's actually this a group of mob that pushes over a truck and lets out a whole like box of killer bees. Killer hornet. Oh, um, the murder, murder hornet. hornets. Yeah. What? I will send you that clip and yeah. you'll be like, what? That's that was insane. crazy. Now, that's my insane. Friend. And maybe that's actually what they were referring to. They, it was it was some uh uh, if it wasn't what, all in one episode, it was sort of conflated with a couple that we actually came up with the, what we're living in today. That's cool. Wow. So my friend Paul Castry, super fan like I am, I'm <laughs> freaking out over her being on the show. Such a great actor and singer. So what's up with the singing? I love that you get to sing on the show all the time. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I um, They do make me sing a lot as Lisa Simpson. Uh, I brought lyrics to uh, the Mona and Lisa blues. I did though, you'll like this. You guys will like this again, cause you're so dialed into the, you write musicals and things. So I sang on a recent episode, um, maybe this time. Oh. And which, you know, from Cabaret. Yes. I'm like, why would you make me do that? Why? But when I was learning the song, I went to Kristen Chenoweth's version. And I mean, first of all, just to listen to Kristen Chenoweth do anything, read the phone book, I was, you know, was pretty extraordinary. And so I by no means have the range. I literally have like a four note range as Lisa Simpson, but they make me sing a lot. So I brought a song for you. I'm gonna sing an acapella. Oh, I'm so excited. This is gonna be terrible in the best possible way. Okay, I'm gonna sing it as Lisa Simpson. 
Okay. I got a bratty brother. He bugs me every day. This morning, my own mother gave my last cupcake away. My daddy acts like, like he belongs in the zoo. I'm the saddest kid, the saddest kid in grade number two. <laughs> oh I remember it all too well. Brava. <laughs> We did do um that's from the the, Sing, the Simpsons Sing the Blues, which came out in December 1990, where at that point we were technically in season two, but we had been what they call a mid-season replacement. So we we started in January of 1990 with the half hour episodes. We actually started in December 89 with the Christmas special, but then the next 12 followed. And so when we picked up again in September of 1990, it was technically season two, but we hadn't done a full season yet. And they had this great idea that the Simpsons had to have an album. Oh, that's, <laughs> oh, cause I remember yeah, there's that Bart song with that song. Yes, do the Bart man. Yes, I have that album. Cause it also has, I think, um, see my vest, see my vest. Yes, uh, does it have see my vest on it? I'm not sure it has maybe, uh, maybe later on. Oh, yeah. maybe, yeah, I can't remember. That is such a great song. Isn't that a brilliant song? Made from real gorilla chest. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Like my loafers? Made from gophers. gophers. Yeah, yes. yes. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, I have you here singing jazz man sounding amazing. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> so great. I mean, but you can tell that that song to really keep it in Lisa Simpson, I can't do it. Because to talk like Lisa Simpson, I squeeze off my throat a little bit, you oh. know? And when you sing, you're supposed to open your throat. So it's completely counterintuitive. And yet it still works. Amazing. <laughs> so I guess the question is like, how do they know that every single person cast is going to be such a brilliant actor? Because the acting is so amazing on the show. So who's responsible for the brilliance of everybody? Is uh, that Jim Brooks? Yes, I y yes, Jim Brooks. So yeah, and and the fact that we record all together like an old radio play is very, very unusual. So every other animated show, you record your bit just yourself. And so when I do my ADR, when I do pickups, of course I do it by myself, where it's certainly, I know the character well enough to be able to do that. But I will say, Jim Brooks, his background being in sitcoms, so Mary Tyler Moore, Rhoda, Taxi, you know, all of these incredible classics, thought when we started doing The Simpsons, the little bunkers on the Tracy Ullman shows thought, well, I don't know why it would be any different just because nobody actually sees your face. It's still acting. You're still having a conversation with people. Of course, you should all be together. And so we've always done it that way. And so I will say one of the hard parts about working, uh, recording from home. So I get directed over Zoom by, you know, one of the writers and um, the script supervisor is in her living room and the sound engineer is in the booth by himself and all that stuff is I don't have Dan or Nancy or Hank to play off of. And and again, even though we're incredibly well-oiled machine, the way you say a line, Seth, would inform the way I respond to it. So it's not my preference. So how many episodes so far have you done in this sort of isolated booth way? Uh, I'm, uh, we've done five, because uh, our season starts in March. So our, our, our season is sort of flip-flopped. Instead of uh, taking the summer off, because we need all that extra time, lead time for animation, we start our season in March and we finish in December. Um, and so we have recorded, I'm, I'm recording episode six tomorrow, I believe. Wow. Yeah. And it's all, you're just doing the lines based on what you're hoping. Yes. But you have the tape, you're still doing the quote unquote table read at the beginning. Like tomorrow you'll be all together, but- That's right. So we'll be all together on Zoom. I'm not even kidding. There's usually on average 49 to 53 people on that Zoom call. 
How great. That's so fun. So when, you're, when you're all recording together, what does Homer do when he's choking Bart? <laughs> oh, so it's great. So I actually stand between them. I stand between Dan Castellaneta and Nancy Cartwright, Dan who does Homer and Nancy does Bart. And uh, Nancy holds her throat and goes, <laughs> and Dan goes like this, and uh, and they sort of choke over me. It's kind of <laughs> <laughs> That's so weird. Yeah. Two things I want to say, don't forget, guys, I love that donations are coming and keep donating starsinthehouse.com, but then forward it, starsinthehouse2020 at Gmail and the jazz man herself, Yardley Smith. <laughs> will I read will, it. I will, I'll read it out loud. Amazing. And you if your question. name is hard to pronounce, please send phonetic, um, phonetic keys so I don't yes, screw please. it up. My son wants to know, was it hard to come up with Lisa Simpson's voice? That's a really good question. Um, the truth of the matter is, is having never done voiceover before I did Lisa Simpson and really never having done it since, um, I just didn't really have that many options. I, I've always known I sounded quite young. And uh, so when they told me that she was eight, and, and by the way, I was, first was brought in to read for Bart, but I'm not kidding, it lasted about 12 seconds. <laughs> it wasn't even like, oh, Yardley, great. You know what, go back. And then a few days later they called me, no, no. They just were like, no, you sound much too much like a girl. How about the sister? And they told me she was eight and I'd always heard like, you heard, you sound like a 10 year old. So I thought, okay, if I sound like I'm 10 and she's eight, then my only option is to go up. <laughs> wow. Well, that would make sense why you were born for Bart because you were playing that tough character in the play. Well, I actually don't think it was that, um, I don't think it was that calculated, Seth. That's awfully lovely of you. I think it was because they always have women do the voices of young boys because our voices don't change. And so, you know, Nancy was brought in to read for Lisa, but she did a lot of animation prior to this. And so she was well versed in and she often played boys. And so she was like, oh, no, no, I have a much greater affinity for Bart. I think it was just a lot of spaghetti on the wall, to be honest. <laughs> what did it pay off? I remember the first time that I met you, you said, hi, my name is Julie. I mean, um, Yardley, how old are you? And I said, I'm 11. And you said, well, hi, I, I've been eight for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I'm eight. And every time I have a birthday, I turn eight. And we just don't talk about that. <laughs> it's just perpetual. I was going to see if you remembered any lines. I actually wrote down some of the lines. Oh, I'm terrible at this, but fire away. <laughs> so Lisa, you, well, first you say to Homer, you know, you promised to take us to the lake. And he goes, I promised you keep lots of things. That's what makes me such a good father. And you say. <laughs> Are we there actually, yet? Are we there yet? No. no. <laughs> no. no. By the way, that's a really good Homer, Seth. That's a very <laughs> good Homer. 100%. He's the best at doing voices. I used to read her this. Oh, thank you. Like the comic books we have back there, he used to read me those every night in everyone's voices. It, oh, my it, God. Thank Super you. Dad. Thank you. That's my March. Um, <laughs> I think, okay. Hold on. Well, this, you, you have to remember this one. This is where they say that you're, your aptitude is to be a homemaker and you're devastated. Oh, yes. And Mrs. Hoover finally says, Okay, now sprinkle the sparkles onto the paper. Lisa, you're not sprinkling your sparkles. And you just say, Get bent. <laughs> Very close. So close. No idea. Shove it. <laughs> Shove it. That <laughs> is hilarious. That is much bluer than I would ever remember. <laughs> and then it cuts to this, it cuts to this girl and she goes, Lisa told Hoover to shove it. And I was like, no way. And she said, afraid so. Anyway, I still remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Upset. I'm obsessed with the show. Okay, so hold okay. on. I have to show another clip. I love this clip because I just I'm obsessed with your line readings. This is you with the fortune teller. Here we go. I love the line readings. I've been waiting for you, Lisa. How did you know my name? Your name tag. Would you like to know your future? <laughs> Sorry, I don't believe in fortune telling. I should go. What's your hurry? Bart, Maggie, and Marge are at the joust, and Homer is heckling the puppet show. <gasps> wow, you can see into the present. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. I will say one of the line readings that I remember that I 
always loved was when Bart gets the elephant stampy. Yes. And she says to him, here's, you know, here's your food. Don't eat it too fast. And then he eats it in one bite and she goes, you ate it too fast. <laughs> <laughs> Dodecahedron. All right. <laughs> so did that too. Cool modi. Ariel. And this is that this I love because I the char that's what I love about the Simpsons. They're so character based. The jokes are not just pop culture references, they're all character. So I love that Lisa, she is a feminist and she is a vegetarian, but she is so haughty about it. And I love when she's called out on it. So this is the brilliant, devastating part. Here we go. It's a football game. That's right. A girl to play football. How about that? Well, that's super duper, Lisa. In fact, we already have four girls on the team. You do? Uh-huh. But we'd love to have you on board. Well, football's not really my thing. After all, what civilized person would play a game with the skin of an innocent pig? <laughs> well, actually, Lisa, these balls are synthetic. And for every ball we buy, a dollar goes to Amnesty International. I've got to go. <laughs> I really I love her so much and I have to say when I watch stuff like that she feels quite separate from me you know she exists so beautifully in her own right and then and then there but there is a tiny piece I'm like oh but there um, there's I'm in there I'm in there but really I'm only 33 and a third percent of the creation of that beautiful little soul no. So interesting. So are you like us where you do you just sit at home and watch episodes and laugh or once it's done, you don't watch them per se? I don't. Um, I'm not a person who goes back sort of in general. Like I don't watch movies twice, really. I don't. Which is fun. And, and I have a terrible memory. So it's not like, oh, I locked it and now we're good. I never have to. Not. I watch it. I got. I love something about it. I loved it, and then I'm on to something else. What are the kind of comedy shows you watch, though? What's your taste in comedy? Well, now, um, well, see, see. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, let's see. What do I, I love? I love really smart, witty comedy. I'll tell you what I don't like because that list is much shorter. I don't like mean comedy. I think it's lazy. I don't get it. I think it can do better. I think it's a way to sort of advocate your um, genius as a person who can actually put words on a page. It's just not my thing. Really, really don't go for it. I don't like people making fun of people. Right. Um, and that includes cursing, right? Because I don't like anyone who is a stand-up who curses. It's just, you find another adjective. That's well said. I, you know, I'm less offended by cursing because I, I cuss like a sailor myself. But I will say... <laughs> In your, if that's sort of 30% of your comedy routine, then I do think that, you know, maybe you're just not for me. I think like a well-placed curse word can go a long way. Um, but, but now on TV, because I have this true crime podcast, I watch a lot of true crime, which I've always loved, but now more than ever. So, um, so I like, you know, I like the good guys to win. That's, and for me, that's law enforcement. So uh, I, I want to see if there are people in the world who are willing and and eager to not abide by the rules that the rest, rest of us abide by in order for society to function well. I want to know that there's another equally um, eager and adept group of people who are willing to put that train back on the tracks. Do you read Anne Rule? I was obsessed with all of her books. No, because the others, I'm telling you all my secrets. I actually don't like to read that much, but I love a book on tape. Oh. So I love, and now one of the great things is they'll actually have the author read their own book. That didn't used to be the way. You know, they would get somebody who might not have necessarily a connection, if, you know, a connection to the material, and it could be either really good or sometimes not really good. And so um, <clears throat> I do love that. But we actually had a detective on the show who, because uh, all of our cases are told by the detectives who investigated the case. And so it's, I do very little talking. I co-host with identical twin detectives, Dan and Dave. And we go to small towns. It's called Small Town Dicks because it's, you know, Dicks being the noir slang for detective. And we go to small towns and get these stories from other small town detectives. And we had a woman um, <clears throat> who did a case that was very famous in the 90s that Ann Rule wrote a book about, actually. 
Which one? I read them all. It was the one about the dentist who killed two wives. Yeah. Crazy. So we actually rarely do cases that you heard of. That's another great thing about the podcast is that they, these are, we always say to the detective, just tell us the story. Give us the case that you're most proud of. Is it your first one? Is it the one that everybody said you can't break it? Is it the one where you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I almost missed that clue. Like what is the thing? It's, we're not all about what's the most well-known one from your town. So that one was sort of an anomaly, but it's a great, great story. I'm so excited because Anne Rule passed away. So now I have like a new true crime thing to obsess about. And by the way, people are, are loving the show. This is the absolute <laughs> best episode that I've done. Just saying so fun and so full of laughter. So Yardley, will you hang around to the end? That's where we're gonna have the donation read. Okay, so I'm gonna bring on Dr. Yay. So here comes Dr. John LaPook to give us a medical update. He's a chief correspondent from CBS. I remember. Hi, Hi Dr. Hello. John LaPook. Hi, John. Hello. Hello, Yardley. How are um, you? Johnny, uh, g give us an update, man. I feel like every day something crazy is happening. Well, we're seeing real friction now. It's been it's been smoldering, but there's real friction now between the people who want to just open up the country willy nilly, uh, and those people who are saying, "Wait a second. And um, you know, we are getting some mixed signals. Remember when you were a kid and you did this? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that dating slang for yes, no, yes, no? Yes, exactly. Uh, I, I see. want you like you can't have me. Mm -hmm. a signal here, and um, you know, we, we it's it's obvious that we're seeing friction where um, where the doctors and the scientists and the researchers are being more cautious than 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 some of the um, uh, politicians are about opening it up. And there's, you know, look, there are arguments on either side, but there's really not an argument about the science of it. Yeah, I was going to say the science, every country that's opened up again, they've had another wave. So like, there's yeah, there, not even a question about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, you understand people are jumping out of their skins right right now. They're they're cooped up. They want to get out. They, they want to say the hell with it. But you can't. I mean, this is the moment where you have to, you keep hearing me say this expression, embrace science, but... Um, this is not the first epidemic that we've been through. It happens to be a pandemic, which, you know, the last big one was in uh, 1918. But um, we, we know about epidemics and we know what, what helps control epidemics. At the end of the day, it's this public health uh, shoe leather type of thing where you find people who are infected, you isolate them, you figure out who their contacts are, and you put them in quarantine. And then that's how you control it. But you cannot do that if the numbers are too high. You can only do that if the numbers have come down. And then when the numbers are down, you can start picking off individual people who get infected. If it's so many people and everybody and their mother is infected, how, how do you get your arms around it? We couldn't in New York City. Uh, and you saw what happened there. Singapore, we're seeing it come back. North, Northern Japan, we're seeing it come back. Um, so look, I. I it's a it's a tough problem, but I think what's the value of a human life um, at the end of the day? Uh, now, on the other side of it, the reason what, why it's not so simple is there are people who, because they're home, uh, there are suicides and there are people who are domestic abuse and there are all sorts of, of uh, people who can't, you know, make a living and one out of five kids was going hungry. So, um, you know, we're, we're in a pickle. But I think the answer is not just opening up and saying the hell with it. I mean, I think you right now you do have to have resolve because, as Tom Inglesby said, and and uh, Tony Fauci also said, you know, it can it can come back and and ricochet. And at the end of the day, if you open up too soon, you may not find out about that the effect of it for two or three weeks, and then it ends up setting you back farther back than you would have had you just stayed the course. Exactly, it's hard to stay the course. Um, all right. Well, I 100% agree with you, Dr. LaPook. Embrace science, as you always say. And I have to say, I, you know, I was up in Vermont. Uh, you know, I, I was um, in self-quarantine up there for a couple of weeks. And then I, I've just come back to New York City because uh, I have to do some things here. I have to see some patients. Uh, so this is the first time I've seen when I, when I saw people walking in the streets with the masks. I'd been up mm -hmm. in Vermont. And it's really shocking to see there's a beautiful anthony mason piece if you could just search anthony mason cbs news uh in the last 24 hours he did a beautiful piece about his city where he grew up 
Mm-hmm. And he goes to the Alice in Wonderland statue where when he was three years old, he remembers climbing on the, on the hat of the, you know, at, and when he was just suddenly able to climb for the first time at the age of three. Anyway, it's a beautiful piece of poetry. Anthony Mason, uh, find it. Thank you, Dr. LaPook. All right, all right. we'll see yeah. you tomorrow as usual. Thank you, Dr. LaPook. He's the best. Always, even if it's negative news, it's positive. <laughs> okay, so you're all I'm going to bring you back at the end to read donations, yeah. please. Do I love corner. you. I love you. I'll be here the whole time. Send me that yeah. picture. Yay. <laughs> and now here comes our good pal, another brilliant comic lady, Ms. Jennifer Smart. <laughs> And I love you, Yardley. And Alessandro Ferdico is one of my <coughs> oldest friends. And I understand that he's one of your oldest friends. And he's watching and he's probably screaming right now. So I'll hear from him later. <laughs> but, uh, I love you. And I want to offer to be your understudy anytime I happen to be free <laughs> until December. I have a great mouth flap. It also takes me eight months to animate my face these days. So. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> you just have to go wide. You know? Okay, I got to go wide. Um, okay, so. Yeah. Jennifer Smart, we're so excited you're here. By the way, you look beautiful. I love the outfit. You got it all going on. Well, you know, I wanted to find something white to match these earbuds, right? Because how do uh, these look good? Right? It's a little I, I, They look like earrings. So what maybe people don't necessarily know is Jennifer's supposed to be on Broadway right now in Company, which is not happening. Yeah. So right now, I haven't really spoken to anybody. What was it like when you got the news that yet again it's being? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you knew it was going to be postponed, but what was yeah, it like? I mean, well, you know, there's there's knowing your partner's having an affair and then there's walking in on them while they're in bed together, right? And so we all knew this was going to come. We all kind of, you know, if you watch the news at all, you could feel it. And then there's the, and, you know, I think anyone who's watching, you know, I call it the King Cuomo power hour, but if you're watching Andrew Cuomo's thing every day and you just listen to facts and data, which I think most people should do, um, uh, it's pretty clear, and so no one, no one knows how long this is gonna go. Yeah, and you just have to do what you can do. But I'm ready for when you do come back to do your hair. <laughs> my girl, I, I hired Julie to do uh, to do my hair, and um, I need those little. I think Seth called them spit curls. They look like little treble clefts, right? So I need you to yes. spit spit on your fingers and. Fix my hair. <laughs> that was gonna be for company opening night. Which was only night. Yeah. yeah, but I well, well, we have a rain date someday. We well, the, the yeah. good news is, according to our listener, Jennifer is so good in company. Everyone was thank rolling you. the aisles every night. Her committee timing. Uh, is- thank you, Danielle. I so appreciate it. I know I I can't speak for everyone, uh, but I I'm quite certain they would let me say that we all <laughs> cannot wait to come back. I mean, we're going out of our skin a little bit, right? Because yeah. Uh, it's just that's what we do. So. It's. I mean, are you outdoors right now? I can't tell where you are. No, I. No, it's just gotten darker. I'm in my living room, and I okay. turned off most of the lights in the back. So no, it's that, pretty, but I was like, part of me is like, is she on a porch? All right, all right. So yeah. people don't know. Jennifer and I go way back. Jennifer and I both met when we came to the city. She's younger than me, but we both met at the same time. And immediately, I guess I knew you were funny because I saw you in Forbidden Broadway. Right. That's like. I helped, did I help you audition for that or did I just, I don't no, even remember. No, actually the very first time we met was down at Rose's turn and I hadn't even moved to the city yet. Isn't that crazy? Wow. And I sang, I forgot what song I sang, but um, of course you were just kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I get all, you know, and then I hit a high note and you were like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, no, 100%. Kind of friends, I hate you know? playing Santa Bar because I was, I hated when people came up to sing because like they didn't, yeah. they didn't know what keys they were going to sing and it was oh so stressful. So right. I'm sure I felt forced to play a few, but then like, she's good. <laughs> uh, and then I, you know, and then I did, then I came to New York. I got an audition and I moved to the city to do Forbidden Broadway at, 22 and uh then uh Big gig, man. i looked and then i looked you up because i knew you were coaching and because i had met you and then we started yeah, doing so those shows at the hospital together and then we oh my the, God, com- you- the comedy shows with jack together and all of that so i'll show that so this is jennifer this is years ago but Jen- we did this comedy show me jack and jennifer it was called uh-huh. an evening with joyce dewitt just as a joke but anyway but just discuss discuss your crazy have a penny need a penny because it's such surreal comedy oh you know it's funny that's what most people talk to me about and i remember you and i did that on a whim in 2010 and that during the video is the thing that people it was just i 
I don't know. I guess it came out of observational comedy, right? And and how I I was just obsessed with all the drugstores and that tray that said, "Need a penny? Take a penny. Have a penny. Leave a penny." And it just became personified to me, and it, it just was annoying to me. So I it just I just thought it would be some sort of weird performance art. <laughs> Anyway, just, all right, we have to enjoy the bizarreness. <clears throat> Need a penny? Take a penny. Have a penny? Leave a penny. Need a penny? Take a penny. Have a penny? Leave a penny. Need a penny? Take a penny. Have a penny? Leave a penny. Need a penny? That was it. <laughs> Did I lose my hair? <laughs> I don't like it. Oh, I'm dying. I'm dying over oh. here. <laughs> You know, and I think I think Playbill rightly said that they did my they headlined that episode. She's so unusual. Oh yeah, my, my camera member missed. I agree. I, agree. I saw you already laughing. I just saw that. Remember, remember the fake hair days. Remember, I used to wear the fake hair clips all the time. Where they I almost know. they almost they almost matched my hair color. Oh, okay, I'm so unaware. I had no idea you were literally wearing fake. I'm so unaware of that. He doesn't even know I have glasses on. Who the hell asked you? Um, so Jennifer, yeah. Okay, so we yeah. got to construct disaster for a minute because we were also heavily involved in that. Yeah. So Jennifer played the nun in Disaster, which, by the way, you campaigned for. And it's just so funny that I didn't think of you. It seems like I can't imagine anyone else playing the role now, but you were doing it play with James. Yeah. And you said, oh, Jennifer wants to roll the nun. I was like, oh, yeah, she'd be good. But like, I didn't realize it was perfect. How did you know you'd be good for it? Uh... I think I saw it at the triad, right? Yeah. And yes. uh, Anika Larson was brilliant, you know, but I think when we were doing that play, she got cast in Beautiful, so I knew the track was going to be open. The track. And I, the track. And so um, I, said to, I said to James, well, if it's not open, if it's open, I would like to be considered. And considering I have known you, this is not only your 100th show, I think in the last two months I've turned 100, so happy, happy <laughs> birthday to us. But and we've known each other for so long. And, um, you know, I don't know. I think I kind of like actors you emulate, you just know if something's a good fit. And I just knew it was going to be a good fit for me, you know? I, I guess we just didn't know how good. Well, I guess we got to tell the triumphant but, uh, story. But I want to say, though, it's also, yes. it's, yeah. it's power to Jennifer saying yes and the importance of it because Anika was leaving Unbroken Circle, my play that Jennifer and Julie and I were in. And, and Jennifer, because she's a supportive friend, had come to see Unbroken Circle. And mm -hmm. because of that supportiveness, she had gone to see Disaster at the Triad. She had gone to see my play. And so when Anika left to go do Beautiful and Jennifer and I are talking on the phone, it's like she already knew it because she was a supportive friend. We talked, you, you and I talked it through mm -hmm. and you were just available and open. And you were like, sure, I'll do it. I do agree with that. Yeah, if you hadn't shown up for it, it's not like, I didn't campaign for you to come see Disaster. You just came to see it because you're supportive. Right. That is yeah, interesting. Me, me and my friend Holly, Holly Davis, we came together and um, we had a great night. But I wasn't thinking at right. all about being part no, of the but show. I, at, but know? it just shows that good things pay off. I mean, it was so nice that you yeah. came that night. I remember you. I would totally yeah. remember you being there. So the, the great story that I think is just so inspiring to artists that I want to just tell about Jennifer's song is that she had this big song in, off Broadway because she played a nun with a gambling addiction. So she finally gives into the slot machine and she sings um, Signs Still Delivered. Like, I'm yours, I'm gonna gamble away. And Jennifer has this amazing voice and she belted the hell out of it. It was hilarious. Drama Desk, Award, Drama Desk nomination. Drama League nomination. Dra Drama League right? nomination. Every review was Signs Still Delivered, I'm yours, the most amazing moment. Like, everyone's obsessed. Show transferred to Broadway. Jennifer comes with it. On Thanksgiving Day, <laughs> six weeks before rehearsals began, Jennifer, what call did you get from me? He, he called me, I was down in Texas making stuffing at my in-law's house and he said, okay, you have about 60 seconds to get it out of your system, but that's it. You just got to just deal with it and we're going to move on. But we lost the rights to sign seal delivered. Okay, deal with it. <laughs> Basically like that. It that's wasn't not angry, but I just said, let's be devastated and then move I on. It, I think it was somewhere in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> 
Probably true. That probably sounds true. accurate. What are you failing to tell? All right, shut up. Go on. So, but, no. okay. Yeah. We were devastated. Well, I knew we had no choice. We've been working so hard to get the rights. Yeah. There was yeah. absolutely no way we are going to get the rights. But we knew that there was a possibility. We had known for a couple of months, and we, because we're friends. And James we and I, you. Yeah. we knew. We but knew we didn't want to tell you. There was a possibility. We didn't know for sure, because we would have told you. But we knew there was a possibility. And we're such good friends. I'm psychic, I think. And I knew it. And I said, are we okay with the rights? And you're like, I think so. Yes, we are. <laughs> it was so weird. You asked that. It was so weird. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, so then Jennifer, we took it in and I said, we're going to find another yeah. song. And then Jennifer, tell everybody the phone call when you call me back, what you said, because I said, we're going to make it just as good. Don't worry. What did you say? Said, no, we're not. We're going to make it better. Which sounds like double talk, but it was so smart. So then I, you know, I wrote the show with my friend Jack and I picked a lot of the music. So I, I was racking my brain and I said, we should do the song Heaven Knows. Heaven Knows, I'm never going to leave you because a nun is about heaven, but it's about a romantic relationship. And I videotaped myself. I was like, here's some ideas I had. But the whole time I'm talking about, oh, yeah, I had an old Victrola, a, mo a moviola. <laughs> Wait, you're always busting me too? How That's dare right. she? How dare you? Let me take my monocle out first. Okay. I, I took out my pince nez. But anyway, I, I was just like, I was settled on it. But this one, I kept seeing him on a stupid chair with his laptop open. Typing, looking, typing, typing. Yeah, looking for songs. And I was like, because he was one of the producers. He didn't write a movie, he was one of the producers. Yeah. And he was looking for songs. And I was like, James, I was like, heaven knows it's amazing. A little part of me was like, how am I going to do that echo? Down inside, down inside. Like, I didn't know 100% it was going to work, but I was like, it'll work. But he kept researching. Cut to, we go to Starbucks a week later. And well, yeah, we, I, I'll never forget it because we were in, we were with your sister and your mom. And we were near where his mom lives. And um, and I remember being in the parking lot. I'm like, no, you guys go into Starbucks. And I had found the song because I was looking at the top, you know, songs for every, basically every year, every month, every researching, week researching. of 1970s. And I came across Never Can Say Goodbye. So he said, what, what about Never Can Say Goodbye? And I was like, oh, I love that song, but I don't know. And I looked at the lyrics and I was like, oh my God. I was like, these lyrics are so relevant. So I was like, this makes sense. I guess I told you at that point. But then he kept researching, which is now driving me crazy. And he- Because he still wasn't 100% convinced. No, that wasn't it. Oh, my life. No, Sorry. I just knew the Jackson 5 version. The, um, right. Never can say goodbye. So I knew that version, but then he found the Gloria Gaynor version, which I didn't even know about, was disco. Yeah. So then I was like, oh my God, we can combine it because we could do the slow, the slow groove, but then don't want to let you go. I never can. So, it, yes. So then I called you. You came over. Remember we went downstairs to my piano? Mm -hmm. And I, I was do. like. I remember the whole thing. And we we kept going. We Then we were like, let us pitch. Let me pitch this. Let me pitch this. I like that. I like, how about this? How about, and we just really, uh, the art, how, it's just a lesson in collaboration and how yeah. you have so many people who really can bring, if you're just open, can bring a better idea to the table that makes something beautiful. Yeah, well you work with brilliantly talented people. So I I have, the, by the way, the end of the story is we did make it better because yeah. Science Still Delivered, the song is all about giving yourself over. Never Can Say Goodbye allowed you to give yourself over and resist it. So it gave you double the acting, don't you think so? Well, yeah, because my favorite thing about the show, believe it or not, is not the song itself. It's all the stuff that comes before it and the tension mm -hmm. that's just beneath the surface. And the thing that I like about the song, even though if you haven't seen the lines before it, you might think, wow, that's really out there. The thing is, if you've seen everything that precedes it, that push and pull makes the stuff that comes before it make so much more sense. Yes, so she's- it, it, support, it supports your text more of your script. Because this character, yeah. Sister Mary Downey is so shut down yeah. She's so not in touch with her urges. She's pushed them down so far that they have no choice but to come out as a tsunami. So I've combined, I literally combined two different versions. I haven't even watched them all. I know it's so weird to watch yourself, but try to take a step back and enjoy. This is two okay. different versions. One is that HD version and one was another one I found, I think from like previews. So it's combination, they're both together. So here oh, we go, right. we, we can all enjoy. Oh, no gambling. This quarter belongs to the orphans. And to you, sir, I say, good business. Good business. 
Good. Good. Never can say why. No, 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 no. I never can say goodbye. Every time I think I've had enough and start heading for the door, there's a very strange vibration piercing me right to the core. It says, turn around, you fool. You know you would love him more and more. Tell me why is it so? Don't want to let you go. I never can say goodbye. Oh, yeah, yeah. I never can say goodbye. No, 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 no. Oh, I never can. Hold on, here's the other version. <laughs> I know, I know that you- I'm fine, you, I'm real, I'm, I'm light, I'm breezy. She's a, but she's like, I added so many more moments. Anyway, here's part two, part two, part two. No, 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 no. <laughs> object and make it so full of soul and life and blood and heart that I am absolutely floored. Well, well thank you. Wow. 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 Are you, wow. Are you kidding? No, oh, I'm my God. Are someone else as teary as I am these days? I cry every day. <laughs> and you've made me, remember the night Yardley Smith made me cry, you guys? <laughs> <laughs> remember that night. Oh Thank gosh. Uh, okay, so that what was it like watching that? I mean, I know like things kind of evolved because that was definitely early on that performance. But what is it like? Can you appreciate some of the brilliance? I can appreciate other people appreciating it. It goes back to what Yardley was saying too. Like you do your work and then you leave it and you're off to the mm -hmm. next thing. And I, I don't like to really I find if I watch stuff I do, I tend to censor myself and I want it to come from the inside out and not the outside in. So I don't, I watch it and I, I try to just remove myself like sort of like a proud aunt. Like, okay, that's lovely. <laughs> my, my niece has some talent. I don't know if she should do this. Hey, Jennifer, do you remember do when you? the night that Clifton Davis came? The guy that wrote the song. Do I? Because he, he was across the street at Aladdin, and that's where my husband was working at the time. And I I remember thanking him, I'm crying. I remember thanking him for giving us, you know, his blessing to use the song that he wrote. And he could not have been more generous and lovely and 
really appreciates how art evolves and he was so uh, he said I never thought that my song would be done this way and I'm so glad that it was and he was just he couldn't have been lovelier and I'm forever grateful because it did change my life let's face it I'd like I'm grateful to all of you and to Jack I mean and to our producers and you know it's certain things in your life change your life and that was one of them so I'm really grateful of course I remember thank you Jennifer but I remember being panicked because what we're leaving out of that story is that Clifton Davis is also a minister. And right. so I was panicked. <laughs> yeah, Yardley. That's, the, that's right, Yardley. We were so scared. And so I was watching him, Yardley, from the from the oh box God. seat the entire time. Like, where is he? Where is he? And I was watching. I was so petrified. I've never been petrified when Jennifer did the song. And I started doing it many, many, many times. This was the one night I was nervous. And I saw him and he was laughing and I rushed backstage during intermission. I said, Jennifer, Clifton loved it. He loved it. Yes. I do. Did I leave that part out? That he was yes. Yes. I, I do remember being nervous now about that, except he's also, I, I don't want to you know, speak for the man, but I think like a lot of uh, artists, he's also well-versed with not, not just the light side, but the dark side. And he's not mm -hmm. afraid of both of those things, not only in himself, but in other people. And he just, to me, that's my kind of minister and human being. <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't have to live mutually exclusively, you know. Is that words, mutually exclusively? <laughs> mutually, mutually exclusive, thank you. I want to talk about awards, because the awards are not really happening right now. So first of all, Yarley, you have an Emmy, which is, it was that your dream to have an Emmy? Because to me, it's, it's so, it's so, you so deserve it. And you got it so early on, you got it like 92, I think, right? Yes, we. Uh, I won it at that time. It was a juried award, so uh, they could have as many winners and or nominees or none as they liked, and it was decided on by you know nine people or something. And I was one of the recipients of the very first year that voiceover acting was actually a category. So um, yes, I mean I wanted to win all the awards. I wanted to be an egot, you know, go get it, go home. Because, you know, why would you just stop at the Emmy? Why Why would you do that? <laughs> mm -hmm. I People have the other three to get, so I'm not doing so well on my quest there. <laughs> and Jennifer, I what a, did you I have a New, a New York Musical Theater Festival award. And, you know, um, I don't think Audra McDonald has any. So I, I well, wanted to call her and tell her that. You that <laughs> as far as NIMF awards, I think I'm winning, guys. I'm winning. Jennifer, talk about yeah. the day you got nominated for a Tony Award for a disaster. First of all, the pressure you felt, and then how did you kind of get into the zone of like, whatever happens, happens? Okay, well, if anyone can bring down a party, it's me. Uh, <laughs> my mom died within that year, or I think, you know, like not soon before we opened. So my perspective was quite intact. And, um, I was living in Cold Spring at the time, and I said to my husband, you know, I don't want to watch them on TV. I want to go down to the gazebo by the water in beautiful Cold Spring, because from that aspect, you have a view of West Point and Storm King, and my, my oldest brother, Tom, is a graduate from West Point, and I have childhood memories at 12 years old of driving around Storm King to go visit him. So I said to Brad, if it happens, we always have this gazebo and this happy memory of this amazing experience, and if it doesn't happen, I have all these amazing memories of my family and childhood, which means more to me. So I just set myself up, I think, to be okay either way. And then I was there and my other beloved brother, Chris, texted me, yes, and then I knew. And like uh, tonight, I cried. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah. So, um, okay, now, speaking of bringing the party down, talk about when your plane almost crashed. It's one of my favorite Jennifer Samard stories. Oh, I was coming home. You could find it on some archive somewhere the Seattle Intelligencer, I think. But when we were doing Shrek out of town in Seattle, a bunch of us from the cast um, uh, were, uh, and, and the um, stage management and, and so on were on a flight home. And right before Chicago, I, I kind of woke up, I was sleeping because it was getting, I was getting very hot. And then I looked and I was like, huh, the lights are off. And um, all of a sudden they didn't say it was an emergency landing, but we were gonna be you know, touching down in Chicago or something. And uh, you could tell as we were getting closer how serious it was. Come to find out much later, the electrical system had failed. And so they were doing a, a manual landing with this jetliner. And even though the landing itself was extremely hard, such that we went off the runway into the grass and, you know, 
uh, blew a tire and, you know, and you could tell coming in, we were coming in hot, as they say, and people were freaking, you know, scared. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't really realize how scary it was. I got really scared once we landed, and thank God we lived, when I saw the line of emergency vehicles charging the plane. <clears throat> and then I realized, oh, Oh, that happened. Um, but Seth, the part that Seth loves is my friend um, Sutton Foster was on the flight, and um, I, I know I, I got off the plane. I said, "Well, you know, thank God we lived because I, I can just see the headline now. It'd be Sutton Foster and others <laughs> perish." <laughs> <laughs> Story of my life, you know. <laughs> oh, you're the and others. <laughs> And others. I never refer to you as an other. Oh, I just, I just that's what I, that's what I do when I'm uncomfortable. I make jokes. So I remember making that joke then. <laughs> thank you. I heard you. And I'm like, I still can't believe that you thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's Yardley Smith, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Yardley, I also I paint little tiny miniatures of every character in The Simpsons. And this is the latest one I just did. I don't know if you could see it at all. Oh, Wait, Grandpa. Can you see it? it is Grandpa. Grandpa. Can you draw that freehand? Yeah. That's I learned from the book you gave me. Crazy. That's I learned crazy. because of you. Are you right? out. <laughs> I'm telling you, sorry, donations. Hold on. Right. I'm not ignoring you. I'm emailing. Oh, no, okay. I'm okay. I, oh, go ahead. Check your phone, Yardley. You just got an email yeah. with a couple donations. I only sent in four. Okay, Jennifer, keep going. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I was going to fill while you were doing that, that um, it's not, I'm paraphrasing, but one of my favorite Simpsons quotes, I'm going to get us in trouble, was about, it's my favorite encapsulation of the gun control debate, and I think it's when Homer goes to buy a gun, and he said, I'm sorry, so there's a three-day waiting period. Three days, but I'm angry now. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. good. Yeah. So Bravo. good. Bravo. Oh, it's so true. <laughs> that is the thing about uh, a pig, like oh, spider hey, pig. Spider pig. Like poor pig, pig. And all from one magical animal. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> that's that's yeah. at least the vegetarian. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. And you know anyway. the story behind um, Lisa the vegetarian is that uh, that's the episode where Paul and Linda McCartney guest star on the episode. Yes. And they said they would only do it if Lisa Simpson stayed a vegetarian for the rest of the life of the series. Oh my gosh. And that was like season eight or something. And we're now in season 32 and he still checks. Oh, well, I know Seth has been a vegetarian since the show has started. Yeah. So have I. You, you, wow. So we've wow. had the same journey. <laughs> Yardley, what if they made that as a writer in your contract that Ms. Smith has to be a vegetarian <laughs> for the rest of the series? You know, I, just, I could probably live with that as long as they don't say I have to only have four fingers. Oh, oh the, those four characters. <laughs> right. Oh. All right. So, Yardley, read, read, read. I heard this before. I have um, Evie from New York, $25. Thank you, Evie, unless it's Evie. Oh, dear. Sorry. Congrats on your 100th show. These shows have been a lifesaver for me. Isabel from Germany, $100. Happy 100th. Stars in the house, Seth and James. I've been watching every episode since day one, and I can't thank you and your team enough for all the joyous moments. Love from Germany. Judy from Ohio, $25. Thanks so much for all you do. Kevin from Virginia, $25. They love The Simpsons and Yearly. Oh, that's so great. Aww. So great. Yay. Oh my gosh, my favorite. Um, all right, in conclusion, everyone has to come back. You guys have been such great uh, guests. So I'll come back, because guess what? Mm -hmm. I'm spending another night at home. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I would love you to come back. And Jen, you have to come back too. Um, all right, James, do we have to wrap up with anything I, I never so. remember? Okay, so I guess I should play the final credits. Okay, so I'll play the final credits. This, right. is, this is dedicated Jennifer, to- our... what a pleasure. What a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for oh, having me. You and yeah. Sandra, we'll go have a couple Yeah, of yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> when we can. Oh my yes, gosh. when we can. We just got locked down till August 1st. I heard. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right, you wanna roll the credits, yeah. Seth? This, this song is for you, Yearly. Yardley. Yardley? Yes. I mispronounced my own name on purpose as a joke. I mean, you completely threw us. We were like, oh my God, we've been saying it wrong the whole time. I know. I know you she did was us. joking. 
Thank you, Julie. Yeah, say, uh-oh, Julie wins. Well, I got scared. <laughs> <laughs>